All right, up next we have Matt, and he's going to be presenting on experiment four, uh, and he's the lead for group one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as you said, my name is Matthew Byrne. Um, we're here for group one for our section. Um, today we're going to be covering the HVAC and commercial AC cycle. All right, so first our objective is we have to understand the efficiency overall for uh, an air heating unit, um, which if you haven't lived in Louisiana, uh, efficiency for is related to, for one, due to your size and a cross-sectional area of the actual uh, point where heat's exchanged between your actual coil and your overall system. Because what you have, because an AC is essentially a giant heat exchange system. Um, you have actual heat entered from ambient air from outside. Um, so, T atmospheric enters, and that's usually hotter. It enters across your uh, cooling coil, which can be either with anti antifreeze or some kind of spray variant, which is by uh, expansion. That material will expand and then absorb a lot of the heat from the outside air when it goes over the coil, or it'll cool by water, which takes a lot larger setup in terms of like what you see at the power plant on LG's campus. Um, it will then come out of that cold tech, uh, cold um, enter, and then it'll come across the first supply fan. The first supply fan's job is to drive the air actually through the system, right? When it comes out of that, there's of course ambient heat from the motor, and that efficiency can vary from that. Um, and when it comes off the motor, you have, you have, then it has to go to another variable heat exchanger. Um, so cool H, cool and H. So from there, it's the variable air. So what we're also going to do today, we're going to be looking at variable air conditioning units or uh, VAVs, uh, variable air volumes. Um, they're basically a series of mechanical uh, dampeners and uh, actuators, so that way you can control the setup and the airflow going into the system. Um, and also, I'm going to give you the difference between the closed loop system of heating and then the open loop system, which we have for AC, because um, we've all been in Louisiana summer. We don't want overcooling, of course, uh, like Aaron pointed out, because then you're going to have too cold, and suddenly your house came, went from blazing hot to freezing cold. And who wants to put on a jacket when you're in Louisiana summer? That's impossible. Um, and then we're going to also understand the variables in air conditioning. Um, so, okay, no, I thought that. So, um, of course, our variables for forward theory. Um, of course, we have Q dot, which is our heat transfer rate. Uh, that's the actual heat that's being removed from the air system. So it's what in our air cooling process that's being removed from across the coil, the heat that's coming off, right? That's been taken out of the system. Um, of course, you have your density of air, your volumetric flow rate, which is one of the things we do have to find is the flow rate of air in coming into the system. Um, so the heat, the T, uh, which is the difference in temperature between the dry bulb and then the dry bulb temp that's been supplied. And CFM, which is the volumetric flow rate into the space. So the difference between that heat and this heat in CFM is that CFM is the actual control rate of the flow that's going into your overall total space, like at the end of the process, right? The actual thing you feel in the room. Um, v dot is what's going inside that. So our equation of importance. First off, we have delta T times the cross-sectional area. So before, as I mentioned, how big your setup is in terms of your AC unit will determine how much actual airflow will be pushed through the system at any one time. So like bigger office buildings, you know, have larger setups. Smaller rooms, like you can put on a trailer, a nice you know, window thing, and it looks really ghetto. So um, it's related to that. The so R thermal is the actual uh, thermal uh, exchange rate between materials, and that is dependent upon the actual thermal properties of the material. Um, so then Q dot, when you, this is actually simplified. This Q dot is the same Q dot up there, just once you transfer it, transform it to a simpler equation, um, and because it relies on density and everything else. So do you really expect results? I know this is brief. Um, the two previous equations, um, so I calculated the expected Q that we got, we had, um, they told us to go from 95 degrees to, uh, fair, uh, Fahrenheit to 55, and so using that for the overall valve system, I got a Q transfer rate of 3.342 BTU per minute, I left it instead per hour, because uh, CFM is usually measured as in a per minute standpoint, not into, uh, not as a per hour standpoint. So then the expected uh, CFM that we're supposed to, supposed to get in feet, uh, cubic feet per minute is uh, 0 0.0879. 430. Okay. Um, so safety first, um, my favorite part. So obviously because we're relying as a heat exchanger upon our thermal properties of material, don't touch anything 
that is going on in terms of the apparatus. For one, it will get extremely hot in terms of the closed loop heating portion. Because uh, the heating portion itself, because it's closed loop, it heats up very quickly. It's all in one system and it's sandwiched between your actual valves for that heat exchange process. Um, don't burn yourself. And that's even part of my last thing. Never turn on the heaters unless the fans are blowing, because then you're just going to have a stagnant amount of uh, fluid inside your system. It's not really going to do anything, and so then the burners inside will actually burn out or, well, become useless um, because it needs the air to actually start burning and warming. Um, you also want to know that your nearest fire extinguisher, it, it's not expected, hopefully, if you do everything right, um, for not there being any fires, but just know in case, because the insulation on there can have a tendency, if not with the burners, to heat up and then start catching fire. And then stay clear of any of the electrical, because that will mess up some of the sensitivities. So the procedure, we want to stay, yeah, sorry, we want to start on desktop, start up the uh, Electron back uh, executable, um, that's your actual main program. Um, the GP must, your, your, your uh, group uh, presenter needs to use the digital uh, site parameter to get the lab room uh, dry bulb temperature and relative humidity rate and set up. Um, from there, you can start setting up the bath conditions. Again, variable, uh, variable air quality, sorry. Um, so when you want to check, for instance, the force damper is open in the relief uh, page option to make sure that that's completely open and that it's ready to go in terms of it's not actually stopping any actuation going into the system. Um, from there, you want to uh, then go through the FDC, uh, which is the force damper control, um, you want to make sure the force damper is controlled <coughs> on the actual end bath, and you want to repeat this for also VAV2. The VAVs are actually two large boxes sandwiched on either end. That's interesting, right? Um, <coughs> so from the cooling loop screen, then you make sure that you record the original initia, initial dry air bulb temperature and relative humidity and the dew point temperature. You go through the VAV1 screen and you may put the cooling temperature set point to the dry bulb temperature set point. Um, from step two, do step six for the valve two for the other system, and then you do the heating loop, uh, go to the heating loop near reservoir base and ensure the fan set point is at LFP per second. You go to the same near reservoir base and input the SCR uh, heat output um, and make sure that's at 95 degrees. So as the loop uh, heats up, go to the cooling loop screen, change from the cooling loop screen, change supply air temps to set point 60 degrees Fahrenheit by changing the, the, the yeah the SCR here. So once the temperature is raised, uh, the chamber temperature is raised, the set point, close the relief damper, valve, valve for valve one, screen, and then by unchecking the force damper, close for both valves. So basically it starts actuating and actually controlling the airflow. Um, you can do this for two, three minutes, collecting data, all data for this experiment can then be recorded uh, via the valve one, via valve two, so these interface screens. And then you start the clock in which in every 20 seconds you're going to record over 30 minute time of uh, the chambers changer. Temperature for chamber A, the uh, control CFM for which is the volumetric flow rate for chamber A and chamber B's temperature and the control volume, the volumetric flow rate for chamber B. Um, once you've done that for three minutes, uh, shut down, let it cool off, turn off both fans once they're relatively ambient temperature and then turn off the AC again. Questions? <laughs> I've never gone over time. That's actually really surprising. What was the whole point of the procedure again? It kind of got really fast. So basically, you want to start up into your user interface and make sure that your VABs have certain settings set. Um, you want to make sure that you close off your first damper for VAB 1, so that way it's actually storing the cold air for the uh, when it's building up to make sure all the air is cooled off in the heat exchange. Um, and then for valve 2, do the same thing, um, so that way there's nothing flowing out. And then once you start it up, you actually control it and control the flow. Gotcha. So basically. you're kind of just controlling the airflow. Yeah, and that's essentially what a VAP does. It's it's basically like a series. Like think of it like um, in terms of volume of uh, any fluid flow. Think of it like your uh, hydroelectric engine. You're just controlling the dam in terms of fluid going into a generator or not. You know that's. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm so sorry that I went for nothing. That's fine. I just got really fast. I got this. <laughs>